So if we're being person-centered, we're treating everybody as an individual, which is hard to do, because um, people can really naff us off, um, and that's okay. <coughs> that doesn't mean to say we, um, you know, we, we kind of have to hate them. We can hate what they did or what they do, but that doesn't mean to say we engage then in all kinds of abusive and, and bullying behaviors as a consequence. So it is about who that person is. Respecting individual rights is, is pretty crucial about trust and about uh, building these helpful relationships. And just to uh, reflect that, um, this is my partner's mother, actually, who died last May. Um, and um, I, I'm coming to the end of you. I, I guarantee that I would use her in my presentations for one year when I talked about presentations. So I'm just at the end of doing that. Because um, she is an example of somebody who is what uh, my colleague Tanya McCants and I describe as receiving person-centered moments as opposed to person-centered care. And I would say that the majority of our patients and residents in our system uh, receive and experience person-centered moments, but not necessarily person-centered care. And the reason I say that is Dorothy uh, was an amazing uh, woman, died at the age of 82, 83, uh, had uh, done Scottish dancing up to the age of uh, late 70s, uh, and then got dementia, um, and deteriorated quite rapidly. And uh, while she had vowed to die in the home she was born in in Aberdeen, which is uh, where she lived, um, she, uh, in the end, for the last year of her life, had to go to, a, go to a nursing home. And of course she did the thing that uh, you know, we all didn't want her to do. She chose the most uh, crappy nursing home there was. We wanted to go into a brand new, you know, spanking, Laura Ashley clad nursing home. No, she wanted one with the wallpaper a bit peeling and that was a bit cosy. Because that was her house. That's her house. And that's where she went. So she was very happy there. Um, she got what we would see as care and a lot of compassion most of the time. There was a sense of being present with her some of the time. They engaged with her as a person, depending on which staff were on duty. Um, they tried to involve her in the decision making, even when she did have advanced dementia, but that was sporadic. So was it person-centered? Absolutely not. And the, the crux for me was when she died and we went to uh, uh, pack up her things from that nursing home, I was handed two black bin liners. And that was that golden moment where you think, no, you don't understand, actually. You really don't understand that this is not how uh, you end uh, the end of somebody's journey, journey in their life. So how we kind of think about this, I think, is really important, that we might be able to all offer an example of person-centered care, but I would ask you to think about, is it really just a moment, or can we actually think about care over a period of time? I'm not going to have too much time to go into this, and there's a poster of it down there as well, and I think it's been uh, kind of drilled into you wherever, wherever you are, um, which is the person-centered practice framework that uh, myself and Tanya McCants have been working with uh, since 2002, actually, this is 2010. Um, and what we've tried to do is to say, if you're going to talk about person-centered care, then you can't just talk about these kind of individual moments where, where people have a good experience. But actually what you have to do is to really... Um, think through the whole structure of the organization, the whole culture of the, of the setting, um, and that essentially is where Francis went wrong, because if you unpick each one of these, then many of these were missing within those care settings. So the model works from the outside in, so the prerequisites, so they're the kind of characteristics of the practitioner, of the nurse, or the care worker, or whoever. Uh, the middle circle is that of the, the environment, so the setting in which care takes place, and then the petals of the flower, as they're referred to, are the care processes, those engagement processes we engage in with uh, patients or residents or whoever. And if we do that, then we achieve these, these outcomes. So the prerequisites are about being professionally competent, and that's not about behavioral competence or ticking off the doing of stuff, but actually it is about our whole being as a professional. How do we present ourselves as a professional and actually engage uh, with, with ourselves in a way that demonstrates professional behavior. Most of these are fairly, are fairly obvious, but the one that I would highlight most um, is that of knowing self. Um, little attention is given, I believe, within our nursing and midwifery programs to how we know ourselves as a person. Who am I? Um, what am I about? What are my values? What drives me? You know, what makes me get out of bed in the morning and do what I do? Uh, what makes me work through the middle of the night and do what I do? Um, what is it that, is, that makes me a person? Because unless I really understand that, I'm never going to really understand that in the context of the person I'm trying to get a caring relationship with. And that becomes very, very important when we're talking about dementia care. 
uh, because um, if I don't understand, you know, how feelings about dementia impact on me, how feelings about aging impact on me, uh, how I feel about my own dementing, if that ever happens, uh, then I'm never going to understand why I react in particular ways uh, to patients when they respond in, in particular ways. Um, our new undergraduate curriculum is, is now based on this framework and um, the whole year, first year is very much focused on this knowing self. Um, who, who am I as a new nurse going, going into these settings? The care environment, of course, is, is also critical. So I can have as much competence as I like, and I can be you know, Florence Nightingale herself, uh, but if the environment is rubbish, it's not going to make any difference what's, whatsoever. And of course, critical to this is skill mix. And in mid-staffs, that was a huge issue. The skill mix was eroded right to the absolute minimum uh, in order to, uh, to save money. And it does worry me in the sense of the continued embargo here, here in Ireland around some of that, about you know, when do we reach a tipping point where actually this is no longer acceptable. And, um, and it's become the norm. I mean, if I, I, I don't even want to ask for a for show of hands about how many people are in acting positions um, in this room, because everybody um, I meet is an acting something or other, um, because of you know, this kind of lack of permanency. And I think that's a really worrying cultural characteristic, actually, and, uh, and one that should not continue for too long. Um, but we also need these other things around shared decision making, around effective team relationships, you know, that we're able to share power, it's not a, you know, a hierarchy, um, and that the physical environment enables us to provide the most effective care, which again is really important, particularly long-term care. The processes, care processes, you can see, um, our research is largely focusing on how do these five processes uh, transfer across all care specialties, because, you know, we all like to think we're unique and different. So because I work in cancer services, then I've got special qualities, and because you work as a midwife, you've got special qualities, and because I work in mental health, blah, 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 blah. But actually, our evidence would say these transcend all of these specialties, specialties, and that if we focus on these, we've got a greater chance of being person-centered, irrespective of the particular specialty that I, I work in. So obviously, working with patients and families, beliefs and values, um, how we engage with people rather than doing things to them, uh, but how we actually really engage with people as people. Um, the way we demonstrate sympathetic presence, which is about walking alongside somebody, really being with them. Um, sharing decision making with patients and families and obviously providing holistic care. And lastly, we can demonstrate these four outcomes. And if we are being person-centered, then we should be able to evaluate these four outcomes on a continuous basis. Um, we have changed from, we've never really um, focused actually in terms of satisfaction per se, but we've now called it experience of good care because what we're evaluating is how do patients and families experience good care? What does that feel like for them? And you do that through stories and narrative um, rather than through questionnaires because you don't, you don't get to it. How do people feel involved in their care? Uh, how do all staff and, and patients have a sense of well-being? And is it a healthful culture? Is it a culture that actually promotes engagement, is collegiate, is responsive to persons, etc., etc.? And our argument would be, and our research would say, that if you can focus on these four outcomes, then you can work your way through all of the rest of it to unpick these cultural characteristics that get in the way of effective person-centeredness. Um, and that it, it actually can unravel itself quite, quite easily, actually. But it does require a whole systems approach. And some of you who are um, studying dementia uh, care in this room may have heard of a wonderful woman called Faith Gibson, um, who is one of my heroes, really. Faith was a, a professor of social work at the University of Ulster, is now uh, retired for a number of years, but really led the movement around person-centered care. Um, and uh, a couple of years ago, she had a fairly horrid experience herself in, in hospital. She's a fairly regular visitor these days into acute care. Um, and uh, I met with her after one of those visits because she was very distressed by it. And it wasn't so much about her own care, but it was about what she observed going on around her. Um, and it's a classic example of how kind of mid-staffs can happen in lots of guises. So on Monday, in her six-bedded ward, she was one of six women, all of whom were relatively self-caring. They could all do stuff for themselves. They were cognitively intact, you know, the kind of typical acute medical ward um, scene. Um, but by Wednesday, she was the only one in that six-bedded ward who didn't have an acute confusion or dementia. And yet, the staff mix didn't change. It was a relatively junior nurse with one care assistant for those six patients on the main shift still, even though the care group was completely different. 
And what she saw was neglect. She saw neglect of five women with dementia and confusion um, because the staff didn't know how to care for them. Um, and that included doctors, physios, OTs, everybody. Um, and she just saw it as a systems issue, not as you know, those bad nurses or bad doctors, but as a systems issue because um, you know, if that was an intensive care unit, you would never allow that same situation to happen. So it raised issues about you know, what's priority, you know, the kind of moral decision making underpinning the leadership, etc. Because you know, if that was a high dependency unit with that degree of dependency going on, you would never leave it to a junior, newly registered nurse and one care assistant. You just wouldn't do it. But yet it seemed okay to do it in this, in this context. So um, Faith's issue is that if we're going to change culture, it has to be a systems-wide issue. So culture is very much about the way the system works. Um, Drennan defined it as the way things are done around here. It's the best definition of culture there is because it's uh, organic and it's in the system. Um, so what that means is that you, you will know the culture of a ward or a unit instantly. I bet you could take any unit you like in the County General or wherever, and you can say, yep, the culture of that unit is blah, 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 blah. And it will be defined by the first time you walk through that door and the way people speak to you, if they speak to you, um, the way people you know, either hide behind the nurse's station or come out and greet you, uh, the way uh, things are posted on the wall, you know, if there's just endless rows of negative notices saying, don't do this, don't go there, don't touch that, um, or if it's a more welcoming place, or in you know, my pet hate if I walk down the ward and just see endless rows of bed rails on, on beds um, and you just go, yep, we know how things are managed here, um, then you, you know that's how the culture, because that's how things are done there. And that becomes the dominant culture. The research into that shows very clearly that people go into those kind of cultures and think, yeah, I'm going to change this. And within a few days, they've encultured into it. They're part of it. Uh, because it, it's very all-consuming. Um, so it's very hard to change it as a lone person in a particular, a particular team. And the reason for that is to do with beliefs and values and assumptions. Unless they're explicit, we just carry them around with us and that's what we, we work with. Irrespective of standard procedures, we work with those things that are, are implicit in our heads. And we're constantly creating and recreating it, so it's, it's just you know, endless in terms of how that culture happens. And what we have to do is to try and unpick the patterns, the patterns of behavior, the patterns of engagement, the patterns of leadership, etc., that exist there. So a person-centered culture, on the other hand, would have shared values. So the question for you would be, in your unit or your team, do you have explicitly shared values that are discussed? They're discussed at team meetings, they're critiqued, they're regularly referred to, they become a kind of a benchmark for how you do things, or do you never talk about those things? Or if you do, you talk about them over coffee and it's all very informal and nobody really knows what they're, what they're really about. Is it situational leadership? So it's not you know, the hierarchical leader who dictates and tells and staff meetings mean people sit in a row and everybody, one person talks and everybody else listens and it's essentially information giving. Or is it more situational leadership that means a leader, you know, uh, coaches and mentors and know staff who need more help than others um, and all that kind of, kind of stuff? Is it collaborative? Do you actually work together as a team? Do you work with patients or residents or whoever uh, in a collaborative way as well? So you can see um, the way we're go going down through here. It is about shared learning and participative learning. Uh, it's about learning happening in practice and a, a culture of learning um, that's not hierarchical and that's innovative, that actually people feel, get a buzz out of their work. And that buzz has more recently been defined as human flourishing which is that we're all actually flourishing in our workplace. And flourishing is essentially that sense of, I feel good about my work, it might be stressful, it might be hard, I might be knackered when I go home in the evening, but I still feel good about it, and I'm growing, and I'm still learning, and I feel passionate about what I do. If we don't have that, we have what uh, Margaret Gaffney calls languishing. We're just kind of getting through the day, um, and hoping for the weekend to come quicker as it, go as it goes through. Um, and that leads to a bad culture if we have that, that kind of dominance. 